Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Life Coach Tom Wells here. Today is Friday. Happy Friday, August the 17th, 2018. 8 a.m. Eastern Time, your first daily dose of happy for this beautiful Friday morning. At least I hope it's beautiful where you are, regardless of what the weather is. I mean, because beauty is in the eye of the beholder, in a sense. And so the question is, what are you beholding? Are you beholding something that looks good? Or are you beholding something that looks bad? Here's the clue. If it looks bad, it ain't it the thing that you're looking at. It's your view. But if it looks good, it ain't the thing that you're looking at. It's you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to sum it up. Right? Isn't that what yeah. it comes down to? <laughs> totally comes down to. There was, there was a guy I used to work for many years ago when I worked in an advertising agency. Um, and this was at the time where uh, the, the ad agency was very much involved in print materials, which most ad agencies are. Um, but this was at the time when computers were just kind of beginning to come into vogue as a thing to use in doing um, in-house graphics and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it was like the age of the early apples when they were in their first really productive range. I mean, the earliest apples were, were cute and they were, you know, they had interesting promise, but they really didn't do very much very well. But when uh -huh. the later models started coming out in like the, the late 1980s, all of a sudden there was something that would work that you could actually use in a, a productive environment. The, the, the PCs hadn't really caught up yet in that mm -hmm. realm and actually to this day they still haven't really caught up in that realm but uh the, the max had and so now there was a, a lot of potential and a lot of hope for people who wanted to um you know to do things that they would normally have had to do with conventional approaches i mean at that time we would do what they called you know cold typesetting and we would do color separations and so forth we would do all these things that were essentially um Oh, slow. I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> they just, you couldn't do them quickly like you could do it with a computer. But on the, by the same token, uh, the computer was a new skill to learn, right? And, and yeah. at that, it's not like today where computers are everywhere and everybody knows how to use them to some degree or other. You know, back then, knowing a computer, knowing how to use it was a big, big deal. I was one of the few who actually, you know, took to it easily, which is one of the reasons I ended up in that job. But um, mm. one of the favorite things that the creative director would say whenever someone was struggling with a computer was, mm -hmm. it's not the computer, it's you, <laughs> which is, almost sounds like you're guilting somebody. But, yeah. his, but what he was really trying to say is, you're, you're frustrated with the computer and what the computer is doing, but what you don't realize is that you set that up. You did mm. that. You, you mm -hmm. did it unwillingly, unwittingly perhaps. Maybe you didn't realize what you were doing, but you yeah. produced that result. It wasn't the computer that produced that result. And, and there's a great message in that because the message is the same as the one that we apply and talk about when we're talking about um, the nature of how you apply the law of attraction in your life and what happens when you do so and what the results are when you when you get the results. And, and the very simple fact is because we're the ones who are attracting everything. It's not the universe. It's you. <laughs> it, it, it's not the world out there that's doing things, these things to you. It's you. It's not right. the people who are victimizing you. It's you. It's not the people who are rewarding you. It's you. It's not the, it's not any of that. It's you. You're the one yeah. who's making it all happen. And, and in a, in a kind of a sense, we're all like loose cannons in that very often we don't realize that we're doing it. So we're like firing shots all off left and right and say, well, geez, that's not me. I'm not doing it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And people get extremely offended, I find, by the uh, insinuation that it's just you, just the same as, you know, an employer of your boss back then might have gotten offended when the guy said, it's not the computer, it's you. Mm -hmm. And here they're having this one frustrating experience after another. Right. And, and they've never experienced this machine before in their life. And they're thinking, how can it be me? Yeah, you know, exactly. It's like, it's this stupid thing. That's right. It's got to yeah. be the stupid thing. <laughs> right. And I think that's what I've, I've run into that lately with a number of people where when they talk about law of attraction, when I talk about law of attraction with them where they know I'm into that, they just do not even want to go near the idea that um, we're going to look at everything f through that lens mm -hmm. because – it's way too painful to say that, you know, the death of my son was caused by me, you know, the, all these different things that they then start to extrapolate and insinuate that, you know, that they are this guilty, guilty, guilty person who should be blamed and shamed 
for not having their life the way it should be. And that's where they go with it. You know, they jump to that extreme view that, um, well, then if you're saying that I'm creating all this, then I must be pretty screwed up. Yeah, know? right. <laughs> and that's like just another extension of that thinking that actually won't work for them because right. they have, you know, it's like, how can you come around to seeing that the results you're getting in your life are being created by you, but you're not a bad person for that. Yeah. You know, it's just simply a reality. Yes. Um, <clears throat> but you know, people just want to feel like they're somehow at the mercy of things. Yeah. We've actually learned how to be blame people. <clears throat> we either want to blame somebody else or we're to blame or the machines to blame, or there's something to blame because we believe that blame has to be a part of the equation. If, if, if mm -hmm. you don't have blame involved, then there will never be improvement, which something is really, like that, yeah. which is really kind of strange when you think about it, when you really look at it up close, because anytime that you have a situation where some person or something is being blamed, you never actually get a positive result out of it, which, which is really interesting, but we keep looking <laughs> really for it, right? Well, we do it to ourselves yeah. constantly. I oh, mean, God. I do it to myself where I'm I'm the one who's not worthy enough, who's not good enough, who's done it wrong, who's made mistakes, or who is still confused or has these weak parts of myself and these confused parts of myself and these scared parts of myself. And how to ad admit and accept the fact that, yeah, I do, but that's okay, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. <clears throat> and that somehow... It's all part of a, a wonderful unfolding of something magnificent called my infinite expansion into the universe, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and yet here's all these um, supposedly dark things or, or things I don't want to look at or things that hurt and things that don't feel good when I admit the fact that, yes, I do have that desire or, <laughs> yes, I never did make that happen and I feel like crap about it, you know, and you know, yes, I am confused about, you know, what I'm going to do about relationships or getting the money I want or, you know, yes, I really am creating this health condition and I don't know how I'm even doing it to myself. That's what's frustrating a lot of times. I think we don't know how we're doing it to ourselves and which is the topic of today's podcast. Yeah. Well, and it's also frustrating when we finally realize, usually through somebody like Abraham pointing out to us, that we're the ones who are not only doing it, but that there's no blame involved. Because once right. you take blame out of it, like, well, well, how, well how, how, how do you hold somebody responsible? You know, <laughs> how, 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 do you, how do you decide that this person's the person who's got to fix it? Well, or how do you fix it if you don't have blame assigned? It's, exactly. it's sort, of like, sort of like you think you hit it a little bit ago when you were talking about how we, we build into our equation of being a human being or something, we build in this idea that somebody's got to be responsible for, yeah. for the screw up, yep. you know, or yep. for the thing that's not working out. And therefore there's a connotation, which I think we heavily got from our parents and teachers, which is if it isn't going right, somebody's got to be held accountable. And that's a bad thing. You know, there's a, there's a blame. The blame means somebody screwed up. Yep. The know? blame game gets played. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that playing game is really something. Amazing thing. By the way, we have a really unusual event for us happening today. Almost as soon as we came on the air, we had somebody connect to us, a listener connecting to us. So, okay. so they're they're waiting in the wings to talk. I think they're waiting in the wings to talk to us. They, they maybe they they tuned in just to listen <laughs> through the platform. I'm not sure, but oh, okay. let's unmute a microphone and see who sure. is on the phone, so to speak. Who who's talking to us today? Is anybody there? Uh, I'm hearing silence, so maybe they're just tuning in to listen. That's okay. right. I'll, I'll I'll mute them back up, and uh, if if uh, you decide, caller, if you decide that you want to talk to us, um, there's a little chat there that uh, you can see through your um, through the Zoom platform because I can see you're plugged in through the Zoom platform. Um, just enter in the chat that you want to talk, and and we'll we'll put you on the air. But uh, you know, feel free to listen, obviously. So I, that's the one thing I'm never really sure about with the, with the Zoom platform that we use, Tom. Because most of the time, people are, who are using the Zoom platform, they're they're wanting to talk to us. So, so that's what that's all about. In this case, uh -huh. it looks like it's somebody who doesn't really want to. They just want to listen in, which is great. We love having listeners. So Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, so, yeah. so the topic, I mean, th this is, uh, as usual, this is one of those topics that you um, 
you spend a lot of time on. You you spend more time on topics than any co-host that I have. <laughs> you, I mean, you are so in depth. You are so thorough. You you want to make sure you have every aspect of a cover, which I I guess it kind of probably reflects how you handle your coaching practice too. That's but, how I handle my life <laughs> and your life. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know that works yeah, too. <laughs> that's why I am a coach because I handle my life by. Um, well, I put it this way: I'm I'm always looking at how am I expanding and how am I growing and what do what am I here to do? You know, why am I, why am I in a human body? That's kind of been ever since college. I started asking that question and I've never stopped because to me, if I'm not asking the question, what's the ultimate value of my being alive, then I'm missing being alive. Mm -hmm. And and I know that I probably overdo it, Um, (laughs) but, but I like it because it, it keeps me in a sense sort of fresh with myself um, because I'm always saying, you know, how am I expanding? How am I free? How am I in love? How am I happy? How am I screwed up? You know, what what do I need to learn? Mm-hmm. So, but it's just fun for me. It's just I have that kind of personality. I like to <laughs> dig into. I like to dig into knowing what is it that makes life what life is. You know. So how this particular we do topic, that a lot of other ways. How huh? does this particular topic come up? I mean, uh, you always have like a, a good reason for it, and I'm not asking you to yeah. delve into your private life or anything like that. But you know, <laughs> where, where, where does this come from? I mean, you know, well, where does this particular idea come from? I would say the last um, number of and many podcasts before that have come from a relationship that I'm in, where I am, you know, so confronted with. Um, the things in the relationship that aren't working out for me that I want to know where those things are coming from and what those things are about without blaming my partner. Mm-hmm. I want to know how am I creating that stuff? If I create my own reality, which I believe I do, as we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast, then how so am I creating this situation? You know, And uh, it's interesting. There's a little exercise that our listeners can do to it's right along the lines of this, which is if somebody really irks you, get a piece of paper and put a line like down the center and on the on the uh, left side, write what it is that that person does that irks you. What what is it that they do that that pushes your buttons? And on the other side, write um, write what that what you make what you make that mean when they mm-hmm. do that. Mm-hmm. You know, or what you made it mean when they did it. So at the top of one column on the left, you say what what he did, what she did, uh, and on the other side, say what I made it mean, <laughs> and mm-hmm. what I make it mean. And then you can. It's a really good way to see how uh, you react, of course. And you might already know, of course, what how they push your trigger. You know, they do this and this, and you know, they they talk in this way. Say say they talk about things in a in a negative, depressing way. And so you put that on the on the left side. You know, he always talks about things in a way that brings me down, or he often talks about things in a way that really brings me down, and mm-hmm. he seems seems to be stuck in negativity. And on the on right side, you write, it, you know, what I make it mean is that is that I don't want to be around somebody like this. Get me out of here. Uh, <laughs> I want to be with people that are uplifting when I hang out with them. And so when you do that, you know, then here's what you do is eventually, you know, like eventually what I did, I was doing this last night, and then you write on the – you know, you, I sort of sum it up, you know, like I say, I say, okay, to sum it up, sum it up is that, well, uh, he's too focused on the negative. He's, he's too dedicated to, to recreating trauma in his life. And then, and then you write, I am that. So that's the, this is the, I am that exercise. Then you write, I am that. And here's the whole idea, obviously, is that, that how do I, um, you know, do that in my life? How am I too focused on the negative? How am I too dedicated to recreating trauma in my life? And then that's the work, you know, then you begin to look into that. And if you do that for several things that irk you, maybe you, maybe you take three people and do a a little chart for each of the three people and how they irk you. And then you see how, how are you that way? (laughs) You know, because the very thing that irks you is a, is a sign of something that you're not looking at in your in your emotions, in your feelings, in your, in, in your makeup as a human being. You could do the same chart, the same exercise 
first things you love about somebody, things you admire, things you appreciate, things that turn you on about hanging out with somebody else. You write the good things that they do. And then you say, well, what, what do you make it mean when they do those things? And then you say, well, I make it mean that, uh, that I've really picked the right friend and that I love, I make it mean that I love hanging with somebody that inspires me. I love hanging with somebody that is motivating, uh, just by hanging with them. They, they're so happy all the time. They laugh so much, you know, and you write those things and then you write, I am that. And so we are these negative things and we are these positive things. But here's the whole trick is that we're, we're making in these things into external aspects that instead of owning them and the I am that exercise helps them own the fact that they're in our hologram, you know, and if we're the one creating this reality that we're experiencing outside of ourselves, then somehow this is going on inside of us. Mm. We couldn't, we couldn't have this happen if we, there wasn't a complementary vibration inside of us. It's the basics of law of attraction. Well, know, it raises a very, every, it raises a very basic concept in my mind because I mean, yeah. the way you entitled it was uh, uh, something like unleashing your emotional guidance system. Yeah. And the, the first thought that went to my head was, well, isn't it always work, working anyway? <laughs> Why, yeah. I mean, I, I, I didn't realize it was on a leash. Maybe it was, but I, I just seemed an interesting way to phrase it. But as you're describing this, I mean, you're describing this process with you know negative stuff, positive stuff. I think what you're really talking about here is how am I going to connect in with that deliberately and, and get, a, get information back, so to speak, that I can exactly. use to, exactly. you know, to influence my life the way I want to influence it? Because, because the negative things, at least I can only speak for myself, is I'm, I'm in denial of them. I mean, and I'm, I'm basically running from them, I think, a lot of my day. You know, I'm, these are the things that on the negative side that I just don't even want to say they're part of me. I can easily get together with my partner and see her do something and then say, God, I can't believe she's like that. You know, I can't believe she did that. You know, I can't believe she said that. And, and, you know, and then, you know, be self-righteous even about how I'm not, I'm not like that. <laughs> self-righteous. You know, I love it. <laughs> right. Like, like, I'm not like that. I'm not, you know, and yet here, here, if you really get honest about it, I mean, that's what happens when you go and do therapy with somebody and with some coaches, you, you start looking at these things and going, okay, how am I like that? And what is that? What's the message in that, that repressed emotion, that emotion I I don't normally want to look at. And of course, sometimes these emotions were, f we're face to face with them when something's not going right in our life. And we're saying, why is this happening to me? You know, why am I going through this with money? Why am I going through this with my health? Um, you know, with my, with my job, this shouldn't be happening to me. And yet we're creating what's happening. We are the, we are the holographic creator of how that thing's unfolding in our life. There's not somebody out there to blame for the way it's coming down. And so then when we're able to look at it and say, and say, okay, I, how am I that, I, or I am that that's happening. And the same with really positive things. We don't, we don't sometimes admit the fact that the thing that we so much love in somebody else that we're so enamored of is something that's inside of us too. Now, as we were talking about before, we don't want to do any of this with blame attached. I mean, that's kind of what we were alluding to earlier, that uh, there's too much blame attached. We really don't want any blame. We don't want blame to even be part of the equation. But we as human beings have a difficulty in that we can't do negatives. <laughs> well, actually, nobody can really do a negative, not even non-physical beings. What do you but mean, do a negative? Meaning that if you take the idea of, well, don't do this, you can't really do anything with that. It's like, no, well, you don't do that. Okay, but what do I do? <laughs> we need, uh -huh. in other words, we're doers. And we, we need to do, we need to state affirmatively what it is that we're doing so that we can replace the thing that we're not supposed to do. So okay. as we're doing an exercise like this, whether we're looking at the good aspects or the bad aspects, like the aspects we like, the aspects we don't like, how do we keep the blame out of it? Or more precisely, what do we do instead of the blame? How do, right. we, how do we refocus ourselves so that we're not focusing on blame, but we're instead we're focusing on X? What's X that we're focusing mm -hmm. on instead? Well, that's an interesting question, and I don't have a perfect answer for it, but what comes to me intuitively is that all of those feelings of blame and shame have to be felt too. See, the reason I picked this podcast, this topic, is because I think that 
whenever I have a feeling that comes up and I say, okay, how do I get around that? How do I, how do I get beyond that feeling? Um, the question I'm having in this podcast is, wait a minute, you're having that feeling, your emotional guidance system's telling you something with that feeling. So there's a recent podcast we did that was about always make peace, make peace, make peace with where you're at. So, mm-hmm. so here's what I'm saying is first accept the fact that you've got that blame. You've got that shame. You've got that guilt, whatever it is. You've got that anger. You've got that sadness, that disappointment, that, that hopelessness, helplessness, whatever, however it's showing up. Mm-hmm. Self-hatred, you know, like you, okay, I, I hate myself for this, you know. Uh, so admit that and look at that and then, you know, let yourself be with it. And the question is this, which we've had on several other also recent podcasts <laughs> is what do you do? What do you do at that point? Um, psychotherapy, of course, would say that's when you, you go into that feeling, you, you maybe find out, you know, does this have an origin somewhere? I don't, you know, I don't know what all you do in psychotherapy because I haven't done that much psychotherapy in my life, but I know that, um, that their premise from what I can tell is you go through the feeling and mm-hmm. you don't bypass it. You don't say, Oh, it's a really big thing. I think I'll just avoid it and it'll go away. Yeah. You and, confront it and, and you, you face it directly and stare yeah, it down. That's what, right. Psychotherapy says you feel it, mm-hmm. you feel it. In other words. So see, I think feelings, here's the question that I'm throwing out in this podcast. Are feelings necessary to be felt? in order to get the direction they have as your emotional guidance system. So if you've got self-hatred, you've got blame, you've got shame, do you need to feel that? What does that feel like inside yourself when you own it? You say, this isn't my partner's fault. This isn't my partner's fault. This stuff's going on in me. When I react to her, it's going on in me. So what is this thing in me that gets so angry at her? Why do I get so angry when she talks like that? And and then, you know, you, you sit with that and let it be and find out what its message is to you. Now, I'm not saying that that's easy to do. And, of course, there are techniques that I would like to learn more of them. And, and I'm basically right now in my life I'm working with um, two different psychotherapists yeah. <laughs> uh, because I want to use their techniques to go deeper into these things because they're upsetting my life so much. Mm. Um, the way that I react to my partner is so upsetting to my life that I'm working with psychotherapists to find out, you know, like how do I unwind my extreme frustration or anger around certain things? Mm -hmm. Because I believe the positive aspects of the relationship are so good that they stand in stark relief to the, to the negative aspects Mm. And I want to, and I want to find out why am I creating such a dichotomy? You know, cause I love, I love owning the fact that I'm creating it all. It's right. just fascinating to me. It's it confronting. It yeah. It's very confronting. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But you're right. It is fascinating. And, and it's interesting. It's like, okay, well, why does my mind work that way? You're, you're kind of getting, getting to know yourself in a sense, you know? Um, but it also yeah. occurs to me, there's another fact here, one we haven't really touched on. And that is if, if what we were engaging in and what we're kind of looking at right now is stuff that essentially is some form of self-hatred, aren't we really looking for a way to flip that around and look for self-love? Aren't we looking sure. for a way to appreciate ourselves and to give ourselves a break, cut ourselves some slack, um, you know, let go of the criticism of, our, of ourselves, let go of the the resistance that we we build up in ourselves because, oh, we're not perfect in the way we think we should be perfect and all this other stuff. Mm-hmm. Isn't it about mm-hmm. just letting go of, of all that and saying, you know what? I'm a pretty good person. You know, <laughs> I, I do some things right. I do actually, I do a lot of things right. In fact, if I allow myself to think about it, there's a whole lot of stuff that's going well in my life. A lot of things that I do that I'm proud of, a lot of things that I do that, that are really good. And it almost doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter, even if you're somebody, I mean, uh, our friend Joel Elston, who does the Thursday morning podcast, this morning on his Facebook timeline posted a flashback where he talked about how 23 years ago he was sitting on his bench in uh, Florida, kind of contemplating his life because he was at that point a ridiculously addicted compulsive gambler. He was in trouble with the law, about to be arrested. He had no money. Mm -hmm. He had no place to go. And Mm -hmm. basically, he was contemplating suicide. Mm -hmm. And when you're in that place, 
that's a really, really tough place to be. And it's a tough place to climb out of. He actually did climb out of it. And he, he's, he, the point of his post was that he's one, lived a wondrous life because he just kept, you know, going at it and trying to figure out how to, to struggle his way out and learning about the law of attraction and how to apply that and so forth. I mean, it was, it's really a very inspiring story. Mm-hmm. But at some point, he had to come face to face with one basic idea. And that is, do I love me? Mm-hmm. And that includes, to in one way or another, deciding that even though I am about to be a convicted felon, I have you know, done all these things that I really regret doing, um, I, I'm now a, a, an addicted gambler, I've, I'm homeless, I, I you know, have been eating out of dumpsters, I, I've been dealing with all this junk. Despite all that, there are still some things about me that are worth loving, that I should love. Mm-hmm. And, and that's for somebody who's like in a really, really bad place. Most of us aren't in a place that bad. I mean, right. many of us can be in places that are pretty bad, but most of us aren't quite that point, you know, where, where we're, we're homeless, we're despondent, where our life has crumbled in front of our eyes, there's nowhere to go except prison. I mean, that, that doesn't happen to a lot of people. You know, most people, they're dealing with problems that by comparison are less. And yet, even though we're dealing with problems that are less, boy, they can still seem so overwhelming that we can't even see our own good side, our own good things going on the things that are going right in our lives. Mm-hmm. That to me is what I think is the real, the real challenge in effect. Can I rip my attention away from all of that angst, from all of that pain and suffering and frustration and difficulty with my relationship, my health, my wealth, whatever it might be, long enough to appreciate what's going right with me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's such a combination of both things I, I'm feeling. It's, uh, it's ability to be so compassionate with myself and so accepting of myself that I say, even though, as they do in tapping, you know, that's even one of the statements as you're tapping, you say, even though I get, (laughs) I I have a deep, you know, um, hatred of myself and I, and I treat myself, you know, really with disdain sometimes, um, even though I do that, I still, am capable of loving myself to the equal amount and even a greater amount. And I am, and I am totally capable of moving beyond my self hatred or whatever. Um, you know, just that love of myself in spite of mm. any things that I might label a flaw or otherwise, um, you know, my problematic self. Uh, and yet I see that in some of these things, we just can't, Mm, they're just not there on the surface all the time for us because we're so good at denying them or re- re- keeping them out of the picture. And I'm just careful with myself right now to say, I don't want to just immediately say, go for the saying, how can I just make things better? How can I make things better? How can I tell a better feeling story? How can I go general and just go have some fun? How can I just get my mind off the thing that's bothering me about myself? I think that that all that is good and I, and I do it all. And yet I also right now am saying, how can I just look at the parts that I've been keeping out of my view for probably most of my life because I don't want to know that I have um, a part of me that is judgmental and critical to this degree. And yet here I'm watching myself do it with my partner. So I'm going, what is it in me that's like that? You know, cause I don't think I'm like that with myself. And yet I think I really am. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's, that's the interesting part to look at because simply I don't, I don't want to have anything lingering down in there that's like a, a unacknowledged monster, you know, that's um, that's going to just show up in other ways in my life. You know, if, if I think I can just put the blame onto somebody else, externalize these feelings, I don't, I want to, I want to see what it's like to own them in a deeper way and even to uncover them because I think, like I said, they're, they're often covered by layers of denial and make everything okay, make everything, make everything okay is not always the best choice. Even though as soon as I, well, I, I do it constantly. I, I make everything okay. And even if I'm facing a monster inside myself, I'm going to, I'm going to make it all okay because there is, I don't really believe any of these things are really as big 
of a threat to my sanity as they seem. Like if Joel's sitting on the bench contemplating suicide, in reality, the things that he's feeling so bad about, I, in my opinion, they're not as big as he thinks they are. And that's how he eventually gets out of them. Mm-hmm. He, he begins to talk to himself in ways that he starts to learn. I'm putting, I'm making these things so big that I'm thinking I have to kill myself because they're so big, Right. but I'm going to learn to treat them differently. Yeah. Um, yeah. He calls that make, process you, awfulizing. I like his word too. Awfulizing. awfulizing? Yeah. It's very descriptive, very evocative of, of how we take something. And it's, it's a word that basically means making a mountain out of a molehill or even making a giant mountain out of a mountain, you know, just making it yes. bigger than it has to be. Yes. Yes. And sometimes with clients, I find, and, and I guess with myself that I can't, I can't just say you're making a mountain out of a molehill. I mean, I say that to clients. I say, I say it in a, in a roundabout nice way. Mm. I say, you know, you're, if you could begin to see that your problems are like speed bumps, they aren't like, like these giant mountains you have to climb and conquer and that they're so daunting that you're just, you're, you're miserable because you know, your problem is so huge. Um, but instead begin to shrink them down a little bit. Um, I remember years ago when I heard that there's this, um, uh, how, how did it go? You know, the, the things that we think are monsters are like when we, when we actually look at them, they're just masks. You know, they're, 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 they're a little mouse wearing a great big mask. You know, they're like the Wizard of Oz. You know, like everything looks really impressive. But when you get up and you really start examining it, it's not that big a deal. Mm. It's actually something that can kind of just be dealt with and you can move on and you can begin to, to no longer think of it as, this massive threat to your very existence. And I I sometimes get clients who, when they start out with me, their problems seem so huge Mm. that they are ready. They are ready to kill themselves, you know, Mm -hmm. or they are ready to, Mm -hmm. I had once had this uh, physician that was ready. He was ready to completely abandon his practice because he had made some mistakes that had, had ruined um, an aspect of a person's health. And, and he felt so guilty about it that he wanted to give up being a doctor. And, um, we worked for, you know, nine weeks to get to the point where he could even continue to be a doctor. Um, but he was making it mean everything about his whole life, you know, that he was a failure on every level, you know, so he had to leave his family. He felt he had to leave everything because he was so. He had screwed up so bad you know, mm. and he couldn't forgive himself no matter what. But he learned to to literally not only forgive himself, but become a really great doctor, mm-hmm. continue to be a really great doctor. Because all he had done is he had made one mistake. Mm. <laughs> you know, yes, it was a big mistake. But anyway, that kind of a thing, you know, where you where you realize that that ultimately I'm the only one that can forgive myself. I'm the only one that's, you know, that's having this holographic experience that I'm creating for mm-hmm. some reason. Yeah. You know, why you, you created it that way. So what is it that you're trying to tell yourself? What is it you're trying to learn from this? And there are some really, really, really awful experiences that people have. I mean, you yeah. just look at the news, which I normally don't recommend that you do. But uh, <laughs> you know, if you do look at the news, I mean, some of the stuff that's coming down the pike in the last couple of days, you got uh, a new uh, scandal about priests abusing small boys in large numbers in Pennsylvania. You've got uh, shootings all over the place. You got Trump going ballistic every other day or actually every other hour. You've got uh, uh, people who are <laughs> opposed to Trump going ballistic every other hour. You've got mm-hmm. uh, and it's like this endless series of of all these really some some not so bad, some really bad, some horrific things going mm-hmm. on. Yeah, there's so many opportunities to take those and make them even worse just by awfulizing them. Right. But the real lesson is that no matter how bad it is, at some point you have to come to the decision whether it's through therapy through coaching, through just, you know, private, quiet thought time, talking to a friend, whatever. At some point, you have to come to the decision that this is where I am right now. No matter what the bad thing was, no matter what I did, no matter how guilty I feel about it, this is where I am right now. Because that's ultimately what somebody who is contemplating suicide is doing. They're saying, this is where I am right now. And they're not liking where they are right now, and they want to end the pain. 
Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. they are at least, to that extent, they're looking at the right thing, which is, this is where I am right now. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the real challenge when you're in a bad place like that is to say to yourself, not only this is where I am right now, but this second thing is where I want to be. And when you can do that much, now you have a basis for the one thing you need more than anything else, and that's to forgive yourself. Because mm-hmm. when, un, until you have some sense of where you want to go, and it, and that thing, that place, that idea, that feeling, that event, experience, whatever, that you want to get to, is in some way, in your opinion, better than where it would be, until you've decided what that is, there's no way to forgive yourself. You've got to have some place you want to get to. You have something else to want. Otherwise, how do you, where's the basis for forgiving come from? Because you well, here, I'm sorry. No, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, there's this thing that Stanislav Goff, he was like the father of, um, well, he was a big f- character in the psychotherapy community. You know, he, uh, he actually was the first one to use psychedelics when he was using in psychotherapy, but he quit doing that because it was illegal. And he created what was called holotrophic work, holotrophic breath work. And, um, you know, in this, in the, in his belief of holotrophic means that everything in your system is always, um, and maybe in a system, I don't know, is always orchestrating itself towards wholeness. So the nature of life is, it's sort of like we did that one podcast about talking about how is the universe truly benevolent and benign? So is it, is ultimately the, the the way things are evolving is an unfolding towards wholeness and towards f- knowing um, knowing the be- benevolence and benignness of the universe, you might say, knowing how it, it all is a beautifully orchestrated, glorious thing to be alive and what the universe is. And if that's the case, that even when you're in a really difficult place, if we could remember that it's all evolving for the right reasons. It, everything is happening for the right reasons. And even in the darkest night, you know, that it's the darkest hour is right before the dawn. And that, and that all that processing that you're going through that seems so difficult is leading you towards revelations and understandings that will change your whole life and that will be helpful to you. And, it doesn't mean though to stay stuck in them if it feels uncomfortable. I mean, you, it's, I think in to experience some level of discomfort is, is actually can be a very healthy thing. It's like growing pains. You know, you go through a little discomfort and, but you feel a lot better afterwards, but I don't advocate. And as Abraham says, oh, we don't advocate you for one second that you be, make yourself uncomfortable in order to f- experience comfort. Mm-hmm. I don't know about that for sure. For for the last four years, I have advocated only that you go for comfort. You know, like no matter what, always just turn towards the better feeling story, turn towards what feels better and go in that direction. Um, but sometimes what feels better is to go through something for me. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's better, you know, for me to go to the gym and and go ahead and start doing the cardiovascular stuff, which is really hard to do. And go ahead and do, you know, lift the weights, even though it it really hurts my joints and my muscles really scream, and I don't like feeling that winded. But I had gotten so out of shape that I've got to. I want to start getting back in shape, so I'm going to go do it. Now I think there's more fun ways to get in shape, mm. like go dance dancing or something. Right, you know? right. <laughs> but on the other hand, sometimes you know I go through a little bit of something in order to have a better result. I might have to give up you know, the, the sugar, the sugar treats I love to eat so much because I just, it's better to get, to go through the pain of giving up the sugar treat than it is to go through the pain of the allergic reaction that I have to it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I pay the price of giving up the sugar in order to not have to deal with this symptom anymore. And even though my mind says, I hate not having my ice cream (laughs) and my candy you know, my cookies. But on the other hand, I love not having my nose run. I love not sneezing all the time, or mm-hmm. I love not having a cough. Um, and, and so you choose the, the higher path in a sense. I, I choose the more, um, the long-term better feeling thing than the short-term, the thing that doesn't really get me the result I want. And I think the real beautiful part of what you just described very eloquently is that 
you start, you, you still started with a point of here I am right now. What do I want? Mm -hmm. And in the course of that description, you described a whole bunch of things that you want. You also described things you didn't want. But after you did, you also alluded to, well, where, what do I want instead? That's really the key to me, because once once we've identified what it is we want, not in terms of what we don't want, not, not limiting ourselves to that. Sometimes we have to start with that just to get the thought process going. But yeah evolving it to the point where we can finally state in positive terms, this other thing is what I want. Once we can mm -hmm. do that, now we have a basis for forgiving ourselves. Now we have a basis for feeling better. We have a business, uh, a basis for um, loving ourselves more because now all of a sudden there is hope. Now all of a sudden there's possibility. And once there's hope and possibility, now you can let go of some stuff. Now you can say, okay, all right, made some mistakes, but at least I can let go of it. And in the process of doing that, we do the one thing that Abraham recommends we do more than anything else. And that is let go of the oars. You know, the, the metaphor of the mm -hmm. river, right? You, you can either paddle upstream yes. or you can you know, ride the, the current downstream. And curiously enough, all the stuff we want is downstream. But we have a tendency to paddle upstream. <laughs> so the trick is to stop oh. paddling upstream. And in, in the way that we're, we're applying that metaphor during this conversation here is we're paddling upstream whenever we're not thinking in the now, whenever we're thinking in the past or you know, about some horrific event or something that we're worried about in the future. And we're paddling upstream whenever we say, well, yeah, okay, um, I, I don't like this thing that happened, so I'm going to continue to focus on all the reasons I don't like this thing to happen. And I just, I, I am just so furious about the fact that I don't like this thing to happen. That's all paddling upstream. Mm -hmm. At some point, you got to let go of the oars. <laughs> mm -hmm. At some point. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah, you're just not going to get anywhere. You're just because that's the thing about paddling upstream. You don't actually get anywhere. You can paddle you like like crazy, but you don't gain anywhere. You don't make any progress. Mm -hmm. And and the the thing that that you're implying when you say that in my mind is that it you're trusting that there is a higher love, a higher power that is unfolding things and knows to go to go to to go to wholeness, that holotrophic idea, you know, that things always resolve to wholeness. And so it's sort of like that thing, trust what's in your vortex. You're saying, but well, I, I, I think that that's a great way to look at it. It's actually not the way I look at it, but, but it's perfectly legitimate to look at it that way. For me, it's just, I don't want to paddle upstream. Downstream is easier. Oh, okay. It, yeah. It's literally that simple from my perspective. Yeah, I, I don't simple. think, I don't think about no, you know, how holistic it is. It's like it's downstream is just easier. <laughs> uh-huh. Oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah, it feels better. I mean, th there's so much to be said for does it feel good? Does it feel good? Does yeah, it feel good? Exactly. Uh, and and that's yeah. <laughs> but but you know, I mean, sometimes what feels good to me is is um is actually avoiding something that that is is calling out to me to uh to look at. And and I don't I just noticed that in relationships, I have this tendency I really believe to just sort of always the second I saw something in a woman I dated that it just rubbed me the wrong way. I said, okay, not, I'm not going to go out with her again. You know, and you know, if she's got that quality, uh, it just would never work, you know? Well, and you're raising an interesting point. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I got to ask a question sorry. here because you said sometimes it feels good. And then you describe the situation, which isn't a really great feeling thing. And it made me wonder, is it that it feels good or if it just is it just that it doesn't feel bad as the alternative? Um, give me an example. Well, uh, let's see. We're talking about uh, whether or not to stay with a person. OK, so mm -hmm. um, and let's say that uh, your, your reason to not stay with them is because they beat you all the time. OK, pretty good. <laughs> pretty good reason to leave somebody. Yeah. You okay. know. All right, so I'm making it very clear and very, you know, very yeah, large dichotomy here, so, so it's very obvious. Yeah. All right, and then the alternative is you say, well, you know, the, the one thing that, that does feel good is, well, maybe I can stay and I can, I can try to work things out. Mm -hmm. And my, my question is, is that really feeling good or is that just feeling better than the pain of having to leave somebody because they're beating you? Right. Yeah. I literally had a client, a client with that exact same situation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I told her, I told her, get away from him. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. But like, my, my, my point is it, it, her, her mm -hmm. initial reaction was, yeah, but it would be, it, it would just be, it would, it would feel good to be there to just try to help him get past all this and all that kind of thing. And, and my, my reaction to that is, I don't think that really felt good to her. 
I think it just felt less bad than having to leave. It felt less bad because her alternative was, um, you know, she felt if she left him, she would lose the only experience of love she had ever had in her life yeah, because right. he also exactly. had given her this love and therefore she didn't believe she could have it again. So and my point thought, is so often some things that we label as, as things that we think right. are good, we really don't think are good. We're just kind of settling for them because they're not as bad. They're the lesser of two bad things. That's yeah. right, yeah. <laughs> right, like most elections in the United States. Yeah, that's right. Well, not just in the United States, around the world, actually. Well, I suppose, <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. right. Yeah, it's true. So, yeah. Um, go ahead. Well, you're really... It, if we take that oh, as whoa. a starting point, then the next question becomes, well, what does feel good? Because we've kind of right. undercut the idea that that thing we were previously labeling as, well, that actually feels good to me to do this, really didn't all that feel all that good after all, it turns out, once we looked at it a little bit more closely. Yeah. So now yeah. the next question becomes, well, what does feel good? And when you're, if you're standing in the place of, well, I thought this is what feels good, and now I realize it didn't really feel all that good, that's your new perspective. That's your new now. I'm, I'm not saying it was necessarily a good choice. That, that's really irrelevant to what I'm saying. The point is that's the new now. That's where you are right now. So from that perspective, what's the next place that feels good to you? And maybe mm -hmm. even that one won't even be a, a true good. It, maybe it'll be another settling. But the point is you're, you're moving even incrementally in a direction of finding what actually does feel good. Uh -huh. And I think the reason that I was talking about everything resolving to wholeness, or if you turn your boat downstream, that you can trust that your life's going to un unfold by simply following the next best feeling thing. And, you know, fo following the flow that, that the things that you want in your life are going to come to you from mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. from going downstream. Right. And it's just, it's just set up that way. And, um, but, I guess for me, like being in a relationship means I want to not immediately say, like I did when I was dating, you know, like, well, if she doesn't have the right qualities, I've got to keep searching for the person that does. Instead of looking in inside myself and saying, if I am constantly immediately finding a fault with every woman I date and then abandoning them, there must be something in me that. I have a hair trigger around and, and then looking at that and saying, what's it like if I, if I go ahead and go out with her a few more times and find out what it is that's going on here inside of myself, instead of just always thinking, change the external condition, change the external condition, change the external condition. Instead, what's, what is it like for me to be less conditional and finding a more unconditional way to love myself and to love another human being and that's that's where the work to me lies in relationships anyway well let, um, let me let me just take a moment there because uh, mm -hmm. we laid out kind of a, a scenario about okay i've reached a new now what feels good to me you identified two different things that are candidates for which one feels good or perhaps which one feels better right. on the one hand quitting the relationship going someplace else on the other hand delving deeply into yourself to figure out why you always react the same way you do so I think the yeah. first question, and, and you, I think you already answered this for yourself, but I want to make it more overt. The first question is, which one feels better? Yeah. And, well, I, th and I think the answer you gave is the delving deeper felt better. Yeah. At a certain point, it it's sort of like letting go of the sugar in your diet. You know, mm -hmm. There's a certain point where, yeah, the sweet is wonderful. I could eat that sweet stuff all day long. But there's a certain point at which I go, you know, but I do see that it seems like when I eat the sugar, then I've got, then I've got all these uh, allergy symptoms. So let me let me bite the bullet here and quit eating the sugar. Well, it's the same thing. All know, right. Like, so so me, you make so you make a decision that says that the delving deeper is the one that feels better, and that's fine. I mean, yeah. it, it does. It, this is not something that has an objective truth to it because what feels better is going to be different for every person. And in your case, this is what feels better: going del mm -hmm. delving deeper. Yeah. Okay, then that that's what feels better. Okay. Now we're at a new now. The new now is now we're looking deeper. And so the, ne the next question is the same question we've been asking all along. What's the next thing that feels better? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that's, that's exactly what I'm doing in my life. And, um, and yeah, that's what I do. 
I keep asking <laughs> that question. And and it's true. I mean, as soon as you look at look at something like, okay, I went through the the detox period to get beyond my sugar blues. Now what feels good? Mm-hmm. You know, well, I think I'll start making uh, chocolate with stevia as a sweetener, you know, or, you know, I found one sweetener I can use that I can get away with a little bit, you know, it's maple <laughs> syrup and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to buy things that are sweetened with maple syrup. Um, but you know, you never, I'm never going to go back to like eating all those things that had cane sugar in them mm-hmm. because that's where that just pushes my buttons right away. And then I get these bad reactions. Um, okay. So I guess but, but, all what, I'm what, saying, but what I'm still that, looking for is what's, what's the good, what thing? feels good. What's the good part. Uh-huh. Cause you just, you, you just described the parts that don't feel good. And maybe well, this feels a little bit better, but what what's the part that feels good now? Well, that's what I'm saying. The part that feels good now, for example, with the with the sugar thing, is that now I can eat, I can make my chocolate here at my in my kitchen using stevia to sweeten it, uh, and I'll still have chocolate in my life. Ah, and now we're onto good. the good part. Now we, can, yeah, I see, yeah, we, we no, see, and, or, th- what, what you just described there really, I think it, it it hits the nut of it very nicely. We will infer in our conversations with ourselves, in our conversations with others, what the really good thing is. We rarely actually say it. You finally said it. You said, I can enjoy my chocolate, but you hadn't said yeah. that before. And I, okay, I'm not, I'm not, yeah. I'm just kind of picking on you a little bit. No, but, that's fine. You know, that's but, fine. but the point is, that's the part we needed to get to. We needed to get to, I can enjoy my chocolate. Cause oh, that's, yeah. that's where we start to feel good again. Yeah. Yeah. And like, like in this relationship I'm in, if, if I can get beyond the four or five things that, that bother me about my partner because, and I don't need to abandon her in order to have the wonderful relationship that I want. Then I can have the new things that I learn by understanding how I was sabotaging that relationship by my extreme reactions to her that were really things that I needed to look at inside myself. These were repressed, denied feelings that, that I didn't want to look at because they felt uncomfortable. But once I got, was able to look at them and own them, then I started realizing that, well, you know what, there's things about this relationship that are so redeeming or that, or that the judgment I had of her was really where the problem was. It wasn't really that she was all that bad. You know, it was that I was, had these extreme judgments and they were making, they were clouding everything because I was bringing my emotional baggage my emotional charge to the whole thing. And I hadn't, I hadn't really owned the fact that I didn't want to look at these emotions inside myself, but they, they were my emotional guidance system telling me how to get more aligned with my source self. My higher self is actually telling me I could have a better, a better experience of life if I would let myself be in this relationship in spite of the fact that I have these, these complaints. You know, get through the complaints and find out what's on the other side of those complaints. And, and when you did that, because you described how you you had actually done this, what was on the other side? Well, what's on the other side? I'm still doing it, actually. Oh, what, okay. <laughs> what's, what's on the other side? Of, I can see, though, that, that largely what's on the other side is that without the charge, it gives it, you know how we're constantly creating our reality moment by moment. Right. So when you, when you come into a room with another person, you're creating the reality that's unfolding in that room. And, and so are they moment by moment by moment. Everything that's happening is being created. And so it's like what you bring in terms of your vibration is then either enhancing the relationship or it's causing it to blow up into something you don't want it to be because you're vibrating with a vibration that is bringing that unrest into the relationship. So I'm, I'm finding that as I deal with the unrest inside myself, then when I'm with my partner, I bring out in her the best. I bring out in her the best that I'm bringing out inside myself. If I've made peace with bringing out the best inside of me, that's what I automatically attract in her. Then I get to see these aspects of her that I've never even seen before. I start seeing, oh, you know, she's, she's more like this and she's more like that. And it's so funny how reality being created moment by moment is a very, uh, it's a moving target. You know, it's wide open for things, for things to morph into a more desirable thing. And if things are always moving towards wholeness and if, if, if what's in our vortex is always the ideal relationship, then the ideal relationship is constantly capable of being unfolded in front of our eyes, right with the person we're with, you know, that things can continue to morph. And I'm not saying you could turn, you know, some horrible person immediately into some wonderful person or I, I don't know how this all truly happens, but it, 
I really believe that it's all contained in our ability to be creators by being surrendered to the fact that life is creating a beautiful life for us. It, it's, the, it's the default of life is to, is to create a beautiful life for us. And for us to get into that place, you know, what does it take to get into that place where we let the money come to us? We really let the health unfold for us. You know, we let the career we really want come into our lives and we find ourselves doing that work we really love. How does that happen? Well, unfortunately, it's probably something we won't, won't be able to get into in great detail because there's only a few minutes left and I have to put out a couple of messages first. So let me put the messages out. We have extra time. We can do it. <laughs> but That's two- okay. I, I, I wasn't trying to get a perfect answer. I'm but but the two messages I want to put out, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the two messages I want to put out are, first of all, for our existing subscribers, our loyal listeners, and we love you dearly, every single one of you, we were really asking you to take a moment and just go to your favorite social media channel and post something that includes the phrase LOAToday.net because we are seeing results from the very, very few, and I mean very few. It's about maybe one to one and a half percent of our listenership are doing it. But even that one to one and a half percent are making a difference. I'm seeing it in the numbers. We're seeing an increase in the number of people who are discovering us. And I just keep imagining, wow, what would happen if all of our listeners were to post just something in their favorite social media, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, about LOAToday.net and and basically accelerate and and you know geometrically increase the number of people who find out about it. Well then you have Instead of hundreds, now you got thousands of people finding about a daily dose of happy and, and getting all this great conversation brought into their lives, into their homes, so that they can find ways to get into that better feeling place, so they can find what it is that they love most and what's the next good thing from where they are right now and so on. I mean, I, that, this this is the, the dream that I have, that more and more people will, will get there. Well, our listeners can help us achieve that dream. It's a dream I know they have too. Everybody who's involved in this podcast wants a better world. Here's a way to do it. Let's spread the word. So please just take a moment, go to your social media channel and just plug something in about LOAToday.net. And if you see that, if you do it on Facebook, I'll actually see it and I'll come back and say, hey, thank you for for the mention. That's great. Mm -hmm. Second message I want to put out, if you're relatively new to the podcast, maybe you're not a subscriber yet, take a moment to become one. It's so ridiculously easy. Easiest way to do it is to go to the homepage of our website, LOAToday.net, because all the instructions are right there. But even if you have uh, perhaps your browser challenged and you aren't really sure how to get to a website, that's okay. If you're on an iPhone, just go through your podcast software. It's one of the built-in apps there. Open that up and do a little search in there for LOA Today. We'll pop right up and you can hit the subscribe button. If you're on an Android phone, you have to do one extra step because most Android phones don't come with an app like that built in. But good news, you just go to the Play Store and do a search for podcast software and a whole bunch of them will pop up. Some of them have fees. Some of them are free. I like the free ones myself. Pick one, install it, and then go into that. Do a little search within that app for LOA Today, and boom, you'll be able to connect that way. But whatever way you do it, please take a moment to subscribe so that you can continue to get all these wonderful episodes coming right to your phone where you can listen to them anytime you want to. So those are the two messages for the day. Oh, actually, there's a third message, Tom, now that I think about it. We have a new Mm -hmm. co-host. Sunday, David David Barkey decided he needed to move on to some other things in his life. The podcast was getting to be a, a bit much for him to do. So one of our co-authors of the book that we published this past May, Your Daily Dose of Happy, Real Success Stories of the Law of Attraction, Anne-Marie Kanata McEwen, who lives in Middletown, good friends of Louise and mine, she's mm-hmm. going to be my new Sunday co-host. So you want to tune in Sunday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern Time and listen to us uh, talking about uh, stuff from Anne-Marie's point of view. I think you're going to find it to be fascinating. Awesome. Yeah. And Tom, for somebody who wants a little more personal attention from you as a professional coach, because you're really good at it, how do they reach out to you? Um, They can go to my website, which is called YouArJoy, Y-O-U-A-R-E-J-O-Y.com. And there's a free half hour you can sign up with me where we can uh, talk about something that's up in your life that you want to get it. You want to do some coaching around and then uh, you can see whether you'd want to work with me from that. Very good. That free half hour. All right. Well, Tom, have a great weekend. I look forward to talking to you on Monday. Yeah, I do too. It's going to be interesting to see uh, what we talk about next. Yeah, you never know. That's the reason you (laughs) want to to keep tuning in. So please do join us next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.